Hello and welcome to another episode of the V8 Supercars Fancast. My name is Kendall. I will be your host as always. And we are going to talk about the Perth Super Night, the first Super Night night race <laughs> at Perth at Barbagillo. Um, of course, a classic track that we've been going to for many years, um, which has also seen a resurfacing recently. So this year was the first year the track has been resurfaced in like 20 years. Um, so records were broken, all that stuff. If you don't understand um, why that's significant, basically it just means the track has more grip in it because they put down fresh tar. Um, so they were breaking records left, right and center. Track times were like two seconds quicker. That sort of thing. Um, so the track looked good. Nice fresh tarmac being laid down. And it looked great under lights. Uh, of course, the last Super Night was last year in Sydney, which isn't returning to the calendar this year, unfortunately. But we did get a brilliant night race in Perth, which was good for me as someone living in New South Wales. Uh, I got to watch the race at a lovely 8.45 uh, after I'd finished work, <laughs> which was I was very happy about. Um, so I was happy. Um, maybe some of you weren't so happy, but that's what it was. Um, let's talk about... Uh, let's start with some news. I don't normally start with news, but there's something that I need to talk about uh, before we move on into anything else, and that's uh, during the gap between Phillip Island and Barbagello, supercars made some aero changes to the Mustangs. Now, the reason for this, and they're not trying to hide it, it's literally because the Mustangs were too fast at Phillip Island. Um, so, um, supercar said the changes are being made based on the racing entitlements contract, uh, which is the contracts that the um, teams have in order to enter cars into the series, and Rule A1.4 of the Supercars Operation Manual. Rule A1.4 spells out the championship's technical parity guidelines, allowing changes if a significant disparity exists between the competing cars. Um, I can't really argue that there was a significant disparity, because, oh my god, the gaps at Phillip Island were horrendously large. Um, I do wish that they had waited until the end of the year before they did anything. It felt like very much a knee-jerk reaction. Um, the Mustangs weren't that far ahead before Phillip Island. Um, they were good. They were better than the Commodores, for sure. Um, but they weren't that far ahead. And if we wanted to really dissect disparity in, in performance, um, then the Commodores should be targeted as well because the Nissans are by far the worst um, by a long margin as well not like they're just there or thereabouts they're pretty much always off the pace compared to the other makes so why are we why are we addressing that one supercars um, it's because they don't want someone to run away with it basically that's the reason they're not even really trying to hide that which I guess I can respect in a way um I do wish they'd waited to the end of the year because just because Phillip Island was a blowout doesn't mean that every race would be a blowout. Um, this is also part of what makes the sports interesting, seeing the teams try and develop and new strategies and try new things. Um, it was pretty clear that Red Bull was severely hampered by the banning of the, the double twin springs. I think that's what it is, or is it just twin springs? Yeah, the twin spring dampeners in their cars, which was banned over the summer. Um, it's pretty clear that they were one of the premier teams that were running that setup. They had mastered it. That was one of the reasons why they were so fast. Uh, since those have been banned, um, well, yeah, since those have been banned, they've struggled to recover ever since. They've won one race this year, um, thanks to Shane, and that's it. So in terms of race wins, which is very unusual for them, even last year when they were struggling during the mid-season, um, they started the season with a bang because Shane took out um, uh, both of the Adelaide openers. And then Craig won, um, I think Craig and Jamie won Tasmania that year as well. So um, even though last year they did have problems in the mid-season and Scotty won like every race, just like he is now, um, they did bounce back. Um, and now that these error changes have come in for the Mustang, 
Um, we will lose the chance to see if um, they really could compete um, with the Mustangs at full strength, so to speak. Um, um, I don't... <sighs> Like I said, I, w I wish they had waited until the end of the year and made the changes over the summer. Um, I really don't see a reason for it to be so sudden. It, the Mustangs weren't that far ahead before Philip Owen, like I said. Um, it is ridiculous that the Mustangs were about eight tenths ahead of the rest of the field. Um, not even the Mustangs, just Scotty. Scotty was, I think, four tenths or something above Fabian at Phillip Island, and Fabian was two tenths above Tickford, and then Tickford was a tenth above Red Bull. Um, so you can clearly see that it's DJR that have mastered um, the Mustang at this point. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if they became a manufacturer team, actually, um, shortly, just like how Holden switched to Red Bull once they started dominating. Um, it's... I don't like it. I wish they'd waited until the end of the year. Um, or at least halfway through the season. I, it felt like a very knee-jerk reaction to me. Um, I can't say I was surprised, though, because Supercars is all about making sure the teams are even. Um, but like I said, in that case, why aren't we doing more to accommodate the Nissans, who are clearly struggling? Um, and for all the people who said that it was, <laughs> it was clearly unfair, um, or I saw a lot of comments on Twitter and whatnot of people upset about the changes which i can't really blame them that they're upset um but no one got this upset when both of the um mustang and the commodore were changed to accommodate the nissans with the center of gravity changes which happened two rounds ago um so it's pretty much in line with what they're always always doing so like i said i'm not surprised i'm not happy um but it doesn't really change anything um supercars has always done stuff like this i wish they'd waited like i said um i wish they'd do more for the nissans if they're going to hamper the mustangs why not help bring the nissans up please that's what i would like um i would really like to see the nissans at the top of the game because there's something clearly wrong with the nissans especially since they can fight right at the top in super two um presumably the same cars can fight at the top of super two but they really struggle in the main game i don't understand what that one's about um but um, that's the way it is. Um, Supercars wants its Ford and Holden rivalry to continue. And as long as one team is a little bit ahead, but not by a huge amount, um, they will be happy. Um, they don't really care if it's Ford or Holden who's ahead. And they don't seem to want to, if there's three or more makes in the championship, they don't seem to want to help the third make who might be struggling a bit. Um to raise them up to a point where they can effectively challenge for titles because we've never seen the Nissans able to challenge for a title, which is something that I really wish we could see, honestly. Um, and I think that does have that is down to probably the parity testing, considering this is a very much a almost semi-spec series. The cards are tested to be um, uh, tested to be uh, very similar in terms of aerodynamic performance. They do this during the off-season. Um, if the cars were that different aerodynamically, I wish they had figured that out when they signed off on it at the start of the season so we didn't have to deal with this. Um, yeah, I mean, what's the parity testing for at the start of the season if not to work these things out before the season starts? And now we're in a situation where parity testing apparently hasn't worked um, and now we have supercars is making snap decisions based on results after races and qualifying. Um <coughs> oh, excuse me. I don't like snap decisions like this. They feel very knee-jerk reactions to me. Um, this is what parity testing is for. If parity testing is not working properly, that needs to be looked at during the off-season when it actually happens. I wouldn't. I don't really like changes like this appearing during the middle of the season. This is the second change that has been made in, for parity's sake. Um, in as many rounds, the one the parity was made for the Nissans uh, before Phillip Island with the center of gravity rules. Um, yeah. Um, this is what parity testing is for, is all I'm going to say. Um, why wasn't this sorted out earlier? 
I don't know. I don't know how parity testing works, but I do know that all the teams signed off on the testing that was done, saying that they were happy with the testing. So maybe something needs to be looked at during the off season. Um, if you want to know exactly what was changed about the Mustangs, um, it's not a lot, honestly. Um, the um, the changes are smaller rear wing end plates, which are the parts of the rear wings that attach the rear wing to the car, if that makes sense. Like they're perpendicular to the car. Um, so it's the, the vertical pieces that attach the horizontal wing to the car. Those are the end plates. Those have been made smaller. Um, the, lower, the lower rear wing gunnery flap, um, which the gunnery flaps are the tabs that at the start and the end of the rear wing that direct the air up or down the car. Um, those have been made, um, or sorry, it's just at the end of the rear wing. It directs the air up over the car um, at the end. It pushes the rear down into the road because air goes up and pushes the rear of the car down. Um, that has been made lower and a reduced front under tray extension, meaning that there will be a smaller protrusion at the front of the splitter. Um, these are all uh, downforce changes. Um and two of which, the gunnery flap and the under tray extension, directly um, affect the um, downforce of the car. So um, the gunnery flap um, is obviously rear downforce and the under tray extension at the front is front downforce, so less downforce overall. Um, and the rear end plates being smaller um, changes the way that the air flows over the car. So it changes the effectiveness of downforce at the rear as well, essentially. Um, they're not big changes, honestly. Um, and uh, I think, unless you put the cars side by side, I don't think you would really notice a difference um, in the way that they look. Um, I was looking, and I certainly couldn't find anything. Um, but it is annoying that things like this have to be... not have to, Things like this are being done midway through a season. I would prefer these kinds of changes to be done during the off-season... <laughs> Um, because this is effectively tampering with results of a season now. It's annoying. It's annoying. Um, that being said, um, it didn't actually do that much <laughs> in the end. Um, then we'll have a look at the results because we will see a definite picture being painted here um, of just almost sheer domination. Um so, qualifying for the first race, the 120km shorter race at Barbagello. Race 11, as they insist on numbering them for some reason. Um, Scott McLaughlin, uh, big surprise, in first with a 52.8, the fastest qualifying lap we've ever seen around Barbagello, obviously because of the resurfacing, but still. <laughs> um, Fabian Coulthard in second, two tenths off. So, not quite as ridiculous as it was at Phillip Island, um, but two temps is still quite a ways off your teammate, uh, especially in this sport. So, that's the way... That's the way it is. <laughs> that's the way it is. Two temps isn't that bad, I suppose, but um, for a teammate performance, especially... Yeah, two temps isn't that bad, but it's not great either. Um, Jamie Winkup inferred three temps off Scotty. Um, and then things tighten up a little bit. So it's Chaz Moster in fourth, um, th 0 0.3, 0 0.31 of a second. So three, 310 temps, um, 310 temps, what? <laughs> 3.1 tenths off, off Scotty. Cameron Waters, 3.7 tenths off Scotty in fifth. So yeah, you get the idea. We're tightening up a bit now. Um, Shane Van Gisbergen in six. Um, he was, just to eat my own words, uh, one and a half temps down from Jamie Winkup. Um, also not great. Shane didn't seem to have a good weekend, to be honest. Uh, not sure what was going on there. But um, it seemed like Red Bull, in particular, were having setup issues um, on Shane's side. Uh, Nick Perkett in seventh. Good qualifying from him. David Reynolds in eighth. Tim Slade in ninth. The BGR guys have been pretty good in qualifying, to be honest. They've, they've consistently been the second best Holdens. Um, Will Davison in 10th. 
Uh, Anton Di Pasquale in 11th, Lee Holdsworth in 12th, Heimgartner in 13th, Rick Kelly in 14th, Stanaway in 15th, Gary Jacobson, probably his best qualifying performance in 16th, uh, Simona in 17th, uh, she was disappointed after not qualifying higher, which I agree, she was quite good at um, Barbara Geller last year. Uh, James Golding in 18th, Todd Hazelwood in 19th, James Courtney in 20th, Mark Winterbottom in 21st. His pace has absolutely evaporated after um, Tasmania. Um, Scott Pye in 22nd. The Walkinshaw and Dreddy cars are struggling, um, which is a shock considering that they really should be up there. Um, with they, they should be up there near Red Bull, really, like considering their history. Uh, Macaulay Jones 23rd. Jack LeBrock in 24th. And Tim Blanchard in 25th. I don't know what's happening at Techno or where that car's speed has gone. They were way faster last year. Um, but they're absolutely nowhere this year. I don't know why. Um, and imagine my shock when uh, I hear that Jack LeBrock's future in the team for the rest of the season was in question until this race. And then he finally got he got the okay to race in the rest of the season, which I was amazed about because <laughs> Jack's been fine. That car has been a dog. And I know Jack has been fine because his best result is fifth place last year at Tasmania. And he's been nowhere near that kind of result this year. Um, so, you know, <laughs> he's clearly a good driver. Um, I've still got my eye on him. Um, I think he's one of the most promising rookies from last year, along with Stanaway. Although I wish Stanaway could be a bit more consistent <laughs> and really vindicate me a little bit. Um, and Anton, I think these three have... And Heimgarten as well. Actually, they're all pretty good, to be honest. The only one I wasn't super impressed with was Golding. Um, <laughs> but um, I do think that they all have relative speed, especially, I think, Jack and even Golding um, could be fine midfielders, you know? Um, I don't think they're going to set the world on fire, but I think they've got they've got speed. Um, so um, it's a shame that that was even in question, but I'm glad he's still driving for the team. Um, it's it's the car that's a dog, 100%, not him. I don't think he's doing anything wrong. I think he's probably driving that car as best he can. But when he's in a team, he's in a single car team in his second season, he doesn't have much experience in the full-time game. What can he possibly do, you know? And uh, Tim Blanchard back as a wild card entrance, um, which was interesting. And he actually did pretty well, considering <laughs> if he was just a wild card. Often we see the wild cards just fade into the back. Uh, but he did pretty good, actually. Um, so we move on to the race results. Uh, Fabian Coulthard beat out Scott McLaughlin for the win after he got a much better start than him. Scotty got a terrible start on this race. Uh, Chaz Moster in third, followed by Jamie Winkup. Shane Van Gisbergen in fifth. Will Davison recovering four positions to six. Nick Perkett in seventh. Cameron Waters in eighth. Lee Holdsworth in ninth. David Reynolds in 10th, Tim Slade in 11th, Simona up five spots to 12th, she had a good race after an early pit stop, which I wasn't convinced would work, I thought her tyres would fade, she pitted very early, I think it was like lap 8 of 50, um, but she managed to hold on to 12th, which I was really impressed about, so good job to her, uh, Anton in 13th, James Golding in 14th, Rick Kelly in 15th, Scott Pye up six spots to 16th, good recovery from him, although 16th isn't anything to be super duper happy about, but it's better than 22nd. Uh, Heimgartner in 17th, Winterbottom in 18th, Gary Jacobson in 19th, Jack LeBrock up four spots to 20th, Tim Blanchard following him into 21st, and Richie Stanaway in 22nd, I believe he had a, an early off, and this is what I mean about him not being consistent, I really wish he would be, <laughs> he's putting his own drive in jeopardy, uh, Todd Hazelwood in 23rd, I'm not quite sure what happened to him, um, I believe something happened, but I don't remember off the top of my head. Uh, Macaulay Jones in 24th and James Courtney in 25th. I'm not quite sure what happened to James either. This is what happens when you have two races with one shorter than the other. I forget what happens in the first race. Uh, let's have one 250km race, please. One 300km race. That'd be nice. I think that'd be ideal for what I do. But, um, yeah, good job from Fabian. He got out in front. He just controlled the race. Um, good to see him win two in a row. Um, he's already won more races than last year. <laughs> Hopefully he can win some more. Um, I really do want him to be up there. Not just because I want him to prove me, prove me wrong about um, my doubts for him. Because I do have a lot of doubts for him. I want him to prove me wrong. I want him to be good. I want everyone to be good. I want everyone to fight for first position every race. 
Um, but I also wanted to be up there because at the moment he's the only person who can actually bring it to Scotty every week. And uh, if he's not bringing it, then Scotty's going to run away with this championship. Absolutely walk away with it. And uh, that would make me very, very sad because it would make my life a lot more boring and it would make uh, it make um, supercars a lot less interesting to watch, that's for sure. Um, I think we were blessed with a good championship last year. So hopefully we get something like that again. Hopefully... Tickford and Red Bull can recover a little bit. That'd be nice. Thank you. Um, but qualifying for the Sunday race with Scotty taking first place by four temps. So who knows? Maybe they'll make even more parity changes <laughs> for next race. Um, four temps. Not even over his teammate, but over Jamie Winkup. Um so Scotty got a 52.9 with Jamie with a 53.3. So those are big gaps. Um, if you were watching something like um, F1, where um, teams develop their cars independently and the goal is to be as fast as possible and within the rules, um, with, you know, unique parts, whatever, whatever, um, you do see it, it would be... It, that would be a big gap. Four temps would be a big gap in F1 where cars are all independent of each other. Um, in supercars, where they're designed to be relatively the same, that's enormous. Um, I know it's not as big as Phillip Island was last round, um, but that is a ridiculously big gap, especially in a place like Barbagello, which is only 50 seconds long. Um, if that's Bathurst, that's nearly a one second faster lap. <laughs> it's because Bathurst is a two minute track. So that's nearly a second faster. Like that's, <laughs> that's ridiculous. That's ridiculously quick. Um, and it's especially interesting because Fabian doesn't seem to be anywhere near the same level as Scotty. Um... In fact, if you take Scotty out of the equation, the times are all really close. They're all really, really close together. Um, I don't know if it's just Scotty being able to get the absolute most out of DJR's car, or if Fabian is just not good enough for that car. Um, because it's clear to me that it's only really Scotty that's able to drag out these incredible times and this incredible pace out of this car. No one else is able to do it. The Tickford boys aren't really super far ahead of everybody else they are ahead but they're not like lightning far ahead um like scotty is and even fabian he has generally been ahead of everybody else um but he has shown um that he is capable of being swallowed up by the other teams if he puts a foot wrong um I really would like to talk, talk to Scotty and ask him where this pace is coming from because it's a mystery to me. It really is. Um, so, there's a few question marks about that in particular. Um, specifically, who is faster at that team and why? Like, obviously, Scotty is a better driver than, than Coulthard at the moment, but why is Scott Scotty so much faster than him? Five temps is a lot to be faster over your teammate. So, Yeah. Anyway, I'll keep running over the results. Uh, Scotty in first, Jamie in second, followed by Chas Monster in third, Cameron Waters in fourth, Fabian Coulthard in fifth. Like I said, five temps down from Scotty. Not good enough. Uh, Andre Heimgartner in sixth. Great, great qualifying for him. Fantastic. Super impressed by him. Um, I really do have my eye on Heimgartner. Um, I do think if he gets into the right team that he could be a contender, a championship contender. I think once he settles down a bit and gets into a team that's a bit more consistent uh, i think the distance are a bit all over the place but once he gets into a team that's a lot more consistent i think he could be someone to, to really look out for i really do um shame gisbergen in seventh like i said not really doing well but again also one and a half tenths down on his teammate so at least he's consistent about it uh will davison in eighth Nick perka in ninth scott pie in tenth much better than uh than saturday but as we'll see things get worse for him um Tim Slade in 11th, David Reynolds in 12th. No pace on Sunday, unfortunately. Um, 
Rick Kelly in 13th, Anton Di Pasquale in 14th, Mark Winterbottom in 15th, Simona in 16th. Still not, still not really good enough for someone who's clearly quite good at this track, but you know whatever. Uh, Macaulay Jones in 17th, pretty close to his season best qualifying result, which I believe is 15th. Uh, so good job from him, I suppose. Um, although again, and as I've just found out, uh, the car that Macaulay Jones is driving, uh, the team Tim Blanchard, I think it's still called really weirdly, um, is actually not the same team as BJR. Um, it's actually just a satellite team in the same way that 23 Red that Will Davison drives for is not technically a part of Tickford Racing. It's just kind of semi-operated by them, um, which might explain why um, Jones is always so far back compared to the other BJR guys. Um, it doesn't explain why Will Davison is pretty much always ahead of Lee Holdsworth, <laughs> but... <laughs> That might explain, if you were wondering why Macaulay Jones always is at the back compared to the other BJR guys who seem to be hovering around that 10th position, uh, that might explain a lot of it. Um, I didn't know that until recently. I'm glad I do know that because now I'll judge him a little less harshly. I still think I still think Jones is uh, not that good, um, but um, I don't think he's any worse than Blanchard was, so... Um, no harm in putting him in there over Blanchard, really. Uh, Stanaway in 18th, Hazelwood in 19th, Courtney in 20th, Golding in 21st, Lee Holdsworth in 22nd, almost a whole second um, off Scott McLaughlin and about five temps down from Chaz Mostert, the leading Tickford driver. Um, that's not good enough. That's really not good enough. Um, I, I remember saying last year that Holdsworth isn't really doing good enough um, and at the time he was in Team 18, so it was a lot harder to judge him. And then he moved to Tickford, and I was prepared to... Well, I was excited to see how he would actually do compared to um, other drivers. I'd have actually some, some actual comparison. And he has consistently been the worst of the Tickford guys, including Will Davison, which is <laughs> um, not a great look at all, especially since he was... Con uh, especially uh, considering he's replaced... Mark Winterbottom, who is probably one of the better drivers on the grid. Um, I don't think he's doing good enough. He's been good at making recoveries during the race, but his qualifying performance has been woeful. And because he's had to start so far back, he's just not had a chance at all, really. Um, like, when Mark Winterbottom is doing better than you consistently, um, and he's in a completely different team, well, we, they swapped teams, and Holdsworth is now in a Mustang, which has gone on to go on all sorts of controversy because it's just so much faster than everybody else. Um, and Winterbottom's in a severely under-budgeted cash-strapped team, and he's doing better than you are. <laughs> and then, you know, um, it's just not good enough. It really isn't. But um, I imagine he's probably safe for a year or two. I don't know how long his contract was, but um, I wouldn't be surprised to see Holdsworth out of that team if he doesn't pick it up soon um so we will see uh gary jacobson in 23rd is another one that i'm worried about i don't think he's doing good enough especially considering that heimgartner was also a rookie last year and he was doing way better than jacobson is this year um so he's jacobson has been consistently the worst nissan driver i know he's a rookie we'll give him more time obviously um but Comparing him to Heimgarten's performance last year, I think those Nissans are definitely comparable. I don't think they've really changed how good they are compared to last year. I don't think they're any worse, really, especially since Heimgarten is qualifying in sixth position. Six, this race. <laughs> and he got a podium in the race before. Um, not in the race before. At Phillip Island, he got a podium, don't forget. And he's qualified sixth in this, in this one. Um, I think it's pretty clear that... Um, Jacobson isn't doing good enough. I don't think Simona's really good in doing good enough either, um, but that one's a bit of a trickier one. So um, I'm a little unsure how to judge Simona. It just always seems to be two Nissan drivers that are kind of always at the back, and it always can, makes me wonder if there's something going on with the split between those two teams. Um, so I'm not 100% sure. This is why I haven't really been judging Jacobson too hard harshly. Um, so hopefully he picks his game up. Obviously, like I said, I want everyone to do well. So 
Uh, Tim Blanchard in 24th and Jack LeBrock in 25th behind the wildcard entrant. That's not something we often see. And he was a good distance behind him as well by a tenth and a bit. Um, like I said, Techno, I don't know what's going on with that car. Uh, remember a couple of years ago when Shane was challenging for the title in a Techno car? <laughs> I don't know what's going on with Techno, but not good. Not good. Uh, but let's get into the results. Scott McLaughlin in first place, um, followed by Jamie Winkup in second, Cameron Waters in third, Fabian Coulthard in fourth, Shane in fifth, David Reynolds up six spots to sixth, and Pasquale up seven spots to seventh. Great job from the Erebus boys. Great job. Uh, Will Davison in eighth. Lee Holdsworth up 13 spots to ninth. <laughs> I know I just gave him a huge uh, chewing out for being well crap and qualifying but that's incredible um great job going from 22nd to a top 10 finish um up 13 positions to do so i don't even really notice him making his way through the field during the race to be honest i wish we'd focused a little bit more on his uh battle through the field but he did a great job um not really enough to make me eat my words because imagine if he'd been in ninth position when he started you know, <laughs> so um, he needs to do better in qualifying. He really does. And um, it, it catches him out. He gets caught up in drama in the race because of because of his low qualifying position. And I also point out that even though he made up 13 spots to make it to ninth, he's still the last of the classified Tickford curse. <laughs> so it's not as incredible as it might first seem, but um, it is a very good job. Don't let that take it away from him. Uh, Nick Perkat in 10th, Tim Slade in 11th, Simona in 12th again, up four spots. Great job from her. Golding up eight spots in f to 13th. Great job from him too. And Todd Hazelwood up five spots to 14th. Uh, Mark Winterbottom in 15th, James Courtney up four spots to 16th, Macaulay Jones in 17th in what I think is maybe his best finish. Uh, Tim Blanchard went up six spots to 18th. Great job from a wild card. Uh, we don't see that very often. Uh, Gary Jacobson in 19th, up four spots. Um, and then comes all of the the troubled cars, really. Uh, Rick Kelly in 20th, um, after he had an interesting incident with uh, Shane Van Gisbergen on the safety car restart. Um, so I will go through these things in probably chronological order, so I'll wait till I get to the end of the results. Richie's down away in 21st. I'm not really sure why Richie's so far down, to be honest. Um, he also finished a lap down. I'm not really, not really sure why. <laughs> I don't really remember if anything happened to him. Um, so my apologies for that. Uh, Jack LeBrock in 22nd. Once again, that techno car. I don't think anything bad happened to it. It's just been a dog. Uh, Andre Heimgartner in 23rd. Two laps down. Um, after starting in 6th place. What happened to him? Well, Scott Pye is not classified and Chaz Moster is also not classified. So let's talk about what happened to these guys. Uh, Chaz went down a cylinder very early in the race and they had to retire the car, unfortunately. Um, he was doing quite well, so it was pretty sad to see. Um, it did a bit of a number on his championship hopes as well, which sucks um, because he's one of the few drivers that seems to be able to consistently get up there. Um... And it kind of was hoping that he would be in the fight a little bit, but <laughs> apparently not. So we will see. Uh, but that's sad for him. Uh, Scotty Pye, not classified. And Andre Heingartner in 23rd position. So, um, ooh, what lap was it? Let's say 46, because that's when Scott Pye retired. Um, so um, coming around the last bend, turn seven, and... Scotty attempts a dive at the inside of Heimgartner. Um, he misjudges his breaking point. He goes too deep. Um, he straddles the curb to try and avoid hitting him. Uh, instead, the curb throws him off. He hits Heimgartner's uh, right rear wheel with his left front wheel, um, completely destroying his own left front wheel, which stopped him from turning um, and spinning Heimgartner around and shredding his... Uh, rear right. He was able to go back to the pits and change it, but that's why he ended up two laps down. Um, but Scotty had to retire. Um, for me, watching the incident, uh, hearing Scotty talk about it afterwards, hearing uh, looking at the onboards, entirely Scott Pye's fault. 100% Scott Pye's fault. 
Um, and um, he wasn't given a penalty because, I don't know. <laughs> um, yeah, no further action was taken for some reason. Just, I don't know. Why not? <laughs> I don't understand. Is it because he retired that they didn't take any further action? Um, maybe. Um, I mean, I guess that makes sense, but, um, you know, like you can't penalize drivers for the next race and it was a hundred percent his fault and it completely ruined Heimgartner's race, um, which was a huge shame. Um, so I was a little confused by that. I guess maybe you could justify that Scotty was out and Heimgartner was still in the race. So like that was punishment enough, but, um, yeah, Scotty stopped the car on the side of the road because he couldn't turn anymore. So they had to call that safety car to remove it. And during the safety car restart, Rick Kelly, who was directly in front of Shane, um, Shane got a better start than him. And he pulled a very, very slight overlap on Rick um, as they're coming up the straight. Very slight. Rick sees him coming up behind him. He attempts to cover him off by pulling further to the right of the track. Um, Shane, knowing or maybe trying just to go around him, maybe not even realizing that he has a slight um, overlap on him, uh, but trying to go around him or whatever he was doing, also pulls to the far right side of the track so that you know he can stay either so he can stay alongside him. Rick continues to try and push him off the track, um, and he he begins to move over um, so that if Shane was to stay alongside him he'd have to drive off the track Shane doesn't do that he stays as on the track uh, as close to off the track as he can while still being on on it so he's basically on the far right side of the road um, attempting to stay on the tarmac as Kelly continues to push right um, and Kelly not realizing that he had an overlap continues to push right um, thinks that he's safely in front he's not um, he hits the overlap he goes spearing into the grass um, which ruined his race as well um, if he hit some styro styrofoam signs and they got stuck in his air vent and it was a whole thing, it was a mess. Um, but, uh, it was pretty clear to me. Um, Kelly didn't realize that there was an overlap on Shane's car. He tried to cover him off thinking that there was no overlap. There was an overlap. And so he ran into Shane. I know I talked about it in a very complicated way. <laughs> Probably maybe it was hard to follow, but, um, the simple form is that basically there was a small overlap. Kelly didn't know about it. And uh, as, a, as a consequence of trying to cover him off, he ran into Shane instead. Um, Shane had nowhere to go. It's not like Shane turned into him. He was on the far right side of the road. Um, Shane tried everything he could to try and not run into him. Clearly it didn't work. Um, short of like l putting on the brakes or deliberately rolling out of the throttle, um, which he doesn't need to do. That's not something he needs to do if someone runs into him he's not responsible for trying to fix that <laughs> um i mean it's a race they're trying to be as fast as possible i don't want people to roll out of the throttle to to avoid what was a very silly incident and entirely kelly's fault um and i was shocked to see some people <laughs> accusing accusing uh shane of being in the wrong which was hilarious because he couldn't possibly have been in the wrong uh, for an incident like that, um, yeah, it was all Kelly's, it was Kelly's fault, I mean, it only affected him, um, and he just didn't see the overlap, which is, it's just a racing incident, that's all it is, um, it's a simple mistake, that's all, um, very, very simple, clear cut to me, no penalty was given, thankfully, um, Tim Blanchard, was given a penalty. I believe it was a for a bump and run on Gary Jacobson. He just slightly slightly bumped into him coming out of turn seven. Um, and uh, he was given a five second penalty, which was weird. <laughs> I thought that was very interesting because I think it was James Golding um, got a hit in the back after trying to come into the pits, completely spun around in front of pit lane, had to recover his car and drive back into the pits and drive into the pits, um, and I don't even know who hit him, they really didn't show it, um, they really didn't show it properly, but I think it was Goldie, maybe it was Stanaway, actually it might have been Stanaway, it would explain why he was so far down, um, and they didn't even look into that incident, someone hit Stanaway, I think it was Stanaway, 
coming into the pits, spun him around completely, um, but they didn't even look at the incident. <laughs> but Blanchard gets a five-second penalty for a mild bump and run on Ga- on Jacobson. I was very confused by the penalty giving in this race. It just didn't make any sense to me. Like, someone completely spun around. I want to say one of the Gary Rogers cars, because uh, I can't remember exactly who it was. Um, and not even looked at. Not even... Um, not even considered. No, no decision making was even indicated upon. Um, but uh, Blanchard got a five second penalty <laughs> for just a simple bump and run. It was ridiculous. Um, that was weird, and it brings up another point that I always have to talk about when Perth comes around. I talked about it last year. Um, but why the hell is the pit entry? Posi- why is there a pit entry where it is? There's a perfectly good. Um, alternative pit entry further up the road and they use this other little shorter one which causes so many problems um, so it was better this year than it was last year but we still had one incident which is too many one incident is too many so if you're not quite sure what I'm talking about basically the pit entry to Perth is on the right side of the track directly after turn 7 uh, because it's directly after turn 7 and it's on the right far side of the track basically completely off the racing line and it's directly after a corner it means that cars going into pit lane have to go a lot slower in order to make the pit entry around turn seven now the problem with this is that the cars behind them aren't expecting them to go into pit lane they're expecting them to go in a straight line they're not expecting them to do a much sharper turn to make it in a pit lane so they're expecting them to put the put down the throttle and start going in a straight line but the people who are going into the pits, they're still slowing down, waiting to put the throttle on so they can go straight into the pits because they need to take a sharper angle. The person behind them thinks that they're putting the throttle down. They put their throttle down and they run straight into the back of them. This is in close quarter racing. Because the car in front of them is trying to turn when they run straight into the back of them, it inevitably sends them into a spin (laughs) it happened three or four times last year it happened again this year and what makes it worse is there's a perfectly good alternative entrance off the back straight with a nice with a nice uh shallow curve into the pits it's the perfect pit entry and they don't use it (laughs) it really annoys me um and it's dangerous I really don't understand why they're still using this other entry when they've got a perfectly good one right next to it. I really don't understand it. Um, it, It'll only take something... All it'll take is someone... Is this to happen to someone who is actually, like, in contention? Um, And for people to make a big fuss about it? And then they'll change it. Um, They don't care at the moment because it's just people who are down the grid... Um, but it's ridiculous that this happens. It's absolutely ridiculous. Um, and it just needs to be changed. It's, it's stupid. It really is stupid that that's, that's the pit entry because it just causes all sorts of problems like drivers having to indicate before they go into the pits, letting other drivers behind them know that they're about to pit. Just use the other entry. The other entry would just completely mitigate this problem at hundred percent. It's so weird. Um, I'd love to see if there's an actual reason that they're not using the alternative pit entry, like it's dangerous or something like that. Um, that's the only thing I can think of is that the shallow angle means that drivers who go off are going to go back onto the track again. Um, but I mean, you could just impose the speed limit as soon as they enter pit lane, as soon as they, almost as soon as they enter it, you know, like, I don't know. That just seems silly. It seems absolutely silly to me. Um, and that's pretty much all the incidents that happened during the race. It wasn't a super eventful set of races to be honest um just a bit more of scotty mclaughlin domination so let's go into the driver standings which are getting more and more depressing every time i look at them um scott mclaughlin is in the lead with 1346 points followed by fabian coulthard who is 142 points behind 142 that means that if fabian comes second and scotty retires Fabian will be tied with Scotty. <laughs> that is a huge gap. Enormous. Um, 
Oh. <laughs> Oh god, I hope I just hope that Scotty retires for like three races in a row or something and we actually get a ball game going. Um Shane Van Gisbergen is in third. He is three hundred and twenty two points down. So that is two whole round wins. To, that's two whole race wins plus twenty two points behind Scotty. That's how far ahead Scotty is. He is nearly one whole race ahead of his teammate, and he is two full races ahead of anyone else ridiculous <laughs> absolutely ridiculous uh david reynolds is in fourth actually mr consistency uh 375 points down Chaz mostert 402 jamie wink 409 will davison 432 uh, nick Percat 469 and uh, tim slade 509 and cameron waters 535 points down that's your top 10 uh Lots of people who are just here on consistency points, um, like David Reynolds, Will Davison, Percat, Slade. It's just where they are based on, on consistency. And consistency, consistency gets you to the championship, you know? Uh, Mark Winterbottom in 11th, Dee Pasquale in 12th, Holdsworth in 13th, Courtney in 14th, Heimgardner in 15th, Rick Kelly in 16th, Hazelwood in 17th, Pye in 18th, Golding in 19th, Dee Silvestro in 20th, Stanaway in 21st, Jack LeBrock in 22nd, Jacobson in 23rd, Macaulay Jones in 24th, Tim Blanchard in 25th, and Jack Smith in 26th. The two wild card entrants. And in terms of teams championship, I don't think I really need to tell you who's in first, but DJR with 2,490 points leads Red Bull Holden Racing Team by 589 point difference. Again, that's ludicrously high. <laughs> it's, um... BJR are in third still. They are the second, third, sorry, second best Holden team, third best team overall. Great job from them. Um, Monster Energy Racing, which I believe is the, ooh, it's Cameron Waters and Lee Holdsworth combination. No, it's not. It's Cameron Waters and um, Will Davison together in fourth. Erebus in fifth. Uh, Chaz Moster and Lee Holdsworth in six, uh, Rick Kelly and Heimgardner in seventh, um, Courtney and Pye at Walkinshaw and Andretti in eighth, Gary Rogers in ninth, uh, Simona and Jacobson in tenth, and then we got the solo teams: Winterbottom in eleventh, Hazelwood in twelfth, Jack LeBrock in thirteenth at Techno, and Macaulay Jones or by himself in last for the team's championship. Uh, in terms of news, we do have a few things to talk about. Uh, the main thing being that there are a hell of a lot of driver contracts up for renewal at the end of this year. Um, I, can't, I can't find anything on exactly who has their driver contracts up. I can't actually find anything on all of the drivers. Um, but I do know, after scouring the internet for a little bit, that David Reynolds, Anton Di Pasquale, Chaz Mostert, and Fabian Coulthard, and at least one of the Triple Eight guys, uh, Jamie Winkup or Shane Van Gisbergen, all have contracts that are up for the end of 2019. Um, we are in for a juicy, silly season. There's going to be a lot of driver swaps, I think. Um, uh, team owner of Erebus, uh, Betty Klimeko, is looking to keep both David and Anton. Um, but if that DJR seat is open, <laughs> it's, if Fabian gets, if Fabian is out at the end of this year, which he might be, <laughs> he very well might be, um, we could be in for a tasty, tasty silly season and a tasty 2020. I can't... <laughs> if this team domination goes up, it continues. If DJR continue to be as dominant as they are and we get a team combination of, I don't know, Scott McLaughlin and Chas Mos Chaz Mostert or Scott McLaughlin and David Reynolds or Scott McLaughlin and Shane Van Gisbergen. <laughs> Can you imagine the sparks flying? Um, we will see what DJR do. They might be perfectly happy with the... Uh, one two combination that they've got um i don't think that personally i don't even think Coulthard's good enough for a number two driver in that team he's so far behind scotty sometimes 
um, a one-two driver needs to be able to get that second place, you know, when Fabian just isn't able to do it a lot of the time. So we will see. We will see, but I do hope that we get some drama coming up at the end of the year with these contracts, contract talks coming up. Um, Chaz will be looking to get, will be looking to move to a team that can get him to the championship. So there's a huge amount of pressure on him to choose the right team. Uh, Reynolds will probably want to do the same, to be honest. Um, he's not exactly young. He's getting on a bit, so he'll want to do that. Um, and uh, ditto for both of the Red Bull boys. Um, Jamie might be happy to just stay where he is. Um, but is the team happy to have him stay where he is, you know? We'll find out. We'll find out. Um, and I know that there is definitely more contract talk coming up. You could probably remove anyone who was signed uh, for this year um, being in contract talks. So Stanaway, Holdsworth, Winterbottom. Um, who else changed teams? Jacobson. He entered Jones, Macaulay Jones entered the team. Uh, pretty much anybody who's just started this year is probably not going to have a contract open. Um, but you never know. Sometimes they do have one-year contracts. Um, but if someone like Heimgartner, say, has his contract coming up, I think he would be fishing around for a good spot. And I wouldn't be surprised if Triple Eight or DJR wanted to take a punt on him, you know? Um, I would back that decision 100%. So, look out for that when it does come up because that promises to be some delicious drama coming our way towards the end of the season. Um, yeah, that that looks... I'm super excited for that, basically. Um, but that is pretty much all the news that I have for you today. And that was the Perth Super Night. Uh, wasn't the greatest round of supercars we've ever seen, but I think we might have to settle in for a bit of a long season with Scotty just sort of dominating this year. Uh, it sort of reminds me of the old HRT days 15 years ago or so where they just sort of won everything all the time. Um, but we look forward, we look onward to the next race. Winton. Winton Super Sprint. Last year was won by, and I remember this, it was won by Rick Kelly and it was won by Fabian Coulthard. So hopefully we see another return to form, the yearly return to form for Nissan. That'd be fantastic. Um, hopefully Fabian picks up picks up the pace. That's what I want. That's what I want. Um, but Winton is quite a ways away. Uh, the event starts on the 24th which is almost three weeks away from now we had a little while to wait until the next event um until then i will see you on the next episode of the v8 supercars fancast thanks for listening make sure you leave a comment like the video all that good stuff um if you have any questions for me make sure you leave a question in the comments below I will answer it in the next episode. But until then, I will see you later. I have been Kendall, a bearded Kendall. I will see you in the next episode.